I'm Kathleen Thompson. Welcome to My Favorite Scene, a special behind-the-scenes look at some of our members' favorite Gilbert and Sullivan scenes. Close your eyes for a minute and picture your favorite Gilbert and Sullivan scene. What makes it so special? Is it funnier? The most biting satire? The best music? Maybe, and maybe not. Each favorite scene and the reasons for choosing it are as varied as we are. In fact, one of our members says that his favorite scene is the one he's working on right now. Now, you know we haven't been able to perform live during the pandemic. We've all suffered through a long winter and can't wait to see each other again. And to see you. We're hoping to stage Ruddigore in November of 2021. In the meantime, we've premiered previous performances on YouTube, creating as much community as possible with live chats as we watch the shows together. Which brings us back to my favorite scene. This video is more up close and personal, a behind the scenes look into five Connecticut Gilbert and Sullivan Society performers' views of their favorite scenes. We've got Iolanthe, Princess Ida, Gondoliers, Pinafore, and Yeoman of the Guard. Each performer tells their story of what makes this scene so special to them and then introduces the clip of the scene. You may see and hear things you've never noticed before as you watch through the performer's eyes. So sit back, relax, and enjoy my favorite scene. Hello, my name is Alan Church, and I am a member of, and former president of, the Connecticut Gilbert and Sullivan Society. I would like to present my favorite scene, which is from Iolanthe. This name, Iolanthe, isn't one most people are familiar with, and it is easy to be misled. Iol and the, Iol and the what? which is one, what one Canadian production did very effectively. The villain of the play, insofar as there is one, is the Lord Chancellor of England. You may have heard of some of the people who have served as Lord Chancellor over the last thousand years or so. Thomas Beckett was one. He was murdered by King Henry II's four rough knights and subsequently made a saint. Cardinal Wolsey is another. He would have been executed by King Henry VIII had he not had the good sense to die first. He did not become a saint. Thomas More, who was executed by Henry VIII and is now a saint. There has even been a female Lord Chancellor, one named Liz Truss. She was not executed by Henry VIII or any other number, but is in fact, alive and in the current British government. The Chancellor is a big-shot English judge. It's a job that, although it is traditional to wear a full-bottomed wig on ceremonial occasions, which a lot of people object to, it, the job imparts so much prestige and gravitas that most lawyers would give, would sacrifice their left hands, if right-handed, and all their law books to win. The unnamed Chancellor of Iolanthe is a bit lacking in the gravitas department. This is possibly because he is mostly concerned with the young women who are his wards and over whom he exercises the power to consent to their marriage. And in this opera, the Lord Chancellor's particular concern is his ward, Phyllis, 
with whom he is inappropriately besotted. Phyllis, however, is in love with Strephon, an Arcadian shepherd, and the very antithesis of the Chancellor. She wants to marry Strephon, but the Chancellor has refused to give his consent. At the start of the excerpt we are presenting, the Chancellor, alone on stage, has just had a lawyerly conversation with himself. <laughs> he is a person of multitudinous capacities and convinced himself to give his own consent to marry his own ward. <laughs> but you will hear all of that in a moment. The Chancellor is abruptly approached by a veiled woman who appeals to the memorials of his long-dead bride, whom he believes died many years ago, on behalf of her son, Strephon, and to give permission for Phyllis to marry Strephon. The Chancellor, though moved, is too full of himself to yield, and a veiled woman reveals herself as Iolanthe, the Chancellor's wife, who is not dead. Strephon, moreover, is his own son. It is a poignant moment, and not at all what you'd expect in Gilbert and Sullivan. What follows is from the Connecticut Gilbert and Sullivan Society's 2007 production of Iolanthe. Renee Molnar Haynes plays Iolanthe, Carol Connolly portrays the Fairy Queen, and I play the Lord Chancellor. Thank you and enjoy. A success! Victory! Victory! Success has crowned my efforts, and I may consider myself engaged to Phyllis. Oh, at first I wouldn't hear it. It was out of the question. But I took heart. I pointed out to myself that I was no stranger to myself, that in point of fact I'd been personally acquainted with myself for some years. <laughs> this had its effect. I admitted that I had watched my professional advancement with considerable interest. And I handsomely added that I yielded to no one in admiration of my private and professional virtues. This was a great point gained. I then endeavored to work upon my feelings, conceive my joy, when I distinctly perceived a tear glistening in my own eye. Eventually, after a severe struggle with myself, I reluctantly, oh, most reluctantly, consented. My lord, a suppliant at your feet I kneel.
May not be, for so the fates decide. Learn now that Phyllis is my promised bride. My bride! No, no. It shall be so, those who would separate us won't be tied. several of CTGNS's shows. I was the understudy for Phoebe in Yeoman of the Guard and in the chorus of that show as well. I also played Kate in Pirates of Penzance and Iolanthe in Iolanthe. The show I want to talk about today is Gondoliers. I was lucky enough to play the role of Tessa and it was really hard to choose my favorite part of this show. Our quartet along with the Don Alhambra had a wonderful time in all of our scenes. This particular show is my favorite because of the ensemble nature of the cast and the wonderful castmates that I had. When everyone you perform with is well prepared, hardworking, and just fun to be with, it really makes for an enjoyable experience. 
a little bit about the plot of gondoliers. There are two handsome gondoliers, Marco and Giuseppe, who don't care who they marry. They are blindfolded and pick their brides, Tessa, played by me, and Gianetta. Meanwhile, the bride of the heir to the throne of Barataria arrives in Venice to adjoin her husband. They were married as infants. The prince cannot be identified because he was stolen by the Don Alhambra and placed in the family of a gondolier who had a son of the same age. Spoiler alert, everyone lives happily ever after in the end. The scene that I chose occurs after Tessa and Gianetta are told that one of them may not actually be married. It leads into in a contemplative fashion. The characters are contemplating the current state of events and things get pretty heated. This particular song is interesting because the characters are all contemplating their inner thoughts and also communicating with one another at other points in the song. It definitely required a great deal of musical skill as well as acting chops to pull it off. Hope you enjoy. And now I have some important news to communicate. His Grace, the Duke of Plaza Toro Limited. Her Grace, the Duchess, and their beautiful daughter, Casilda. I say, their beautiful daughter, Casilda. We heard you. Have arrived at Barataria and may be here at any moment. The Duke and Duchess are nothing to us. Ah, but the daughter, the beautiful daughter. <laughs> oh, you're a lucky dog, one of you. <laughs> I think you're a very incomprehensible old gentleman. Oh, not a bit. I'll explain. Many years ago, when you, whichever you are, were a baby, you, whichever you are, were married to a little girl who has grown up to be the most beautiful young lady in Spain. That beautiful young lady will be here to claim you, whichever you are, in half an hour. And I congratulate that one, whichever it is, with all my heart. Married when a baby? But we were married three months ago. One of you, only one. The other, whichever it is, is an unintentional bigamist. <laughs> well, upon my word. And who are these young people? Who are we? Why, and their wives, of course. We've just, just arrived. Their wives? Oh, dear. It's very unfortunate, isn't it? This complicates matters. What, what will Her Majesty say? And do you mean to say that one of these monarchs was already married, and that neither of us will be queen. That is the idea I intended to convey officially. Yes, sir, my dear, dear child. Get away, perhaps it's you. My poor, poor little woman. Don't! Who knows whose husband you are? And pray, why didn't you tell us all about it before they left Venice? Because if I had, no earthly temptation would have induced these gentlemen to leave to such Extremely fascinating <laughs> and utterly irresistible <laughs> little lady. <laughs> oh, there's something in that. <laughs> I may mention that you will not be kept long in suspense, as the old lady who nursed the royal child is at present in the... Also, <laughs> Chamber, waiting for me to, um, interview her. Poor old girl. Hadn't you better go and put her out of her suspense? <laughs> oh. oh, no, no, there's no hurry. She's all right. She has all the illustrated papers. However, I will go and interrogate her. And in the meantime, May I suggest the absolute propriety of your regarding yourselves as single, young ladies? Ciao. Single ladies? Well, there's a pleasant state of things. Delightful. 
One of us is married to two young ladies, and nobody knows which. And the other is married to one young lady whom nobody can identify. And one of us is married to one of you, and the other is married to nobody. But which of you is married to which of us, and what's to become of the other? It's quite simple. Observe. Two husbands have managed to acquire three wives. Three wives, two husbands, that's, um... Two-thirds of a husband to each wife. Oh, Mount Vesuvius, here we are in arithmetic. My good sir, one can't marry a vulgar fraction. You've no right to call me a vulgar fraction. But we are getting rather mixed. The situation is entangled. Let's try and comb it out. My name is Tim Throckmorton, and I portrayed Fairfax in the 2013 Connecticut GNS production of Yeoman of the Guard. Throughout my life, Gilbert and Sullivan and the crazy people who love to perform their works have been a touchstone of fun, friendship, and community for me. We started rehearsals on June 30, but Kathy and I did not officially move from Pennsylvania to Connecticut until we sold our Pennsylvania house at the end of September. I commuted back to Pennsylvania every Friday, only to return to Connecticut for the weekly Sunday rehearsals. To say the least, it was a time of great change in my personal life, but this production of Yeoman was a steady, dependable, welcoming foundation. Yeoman is generally thought of as GNS's most dramatic and operatic work. Much of the drama in Yeoman, as shown in the scene you are about to see, surrounds the triangular relationship of Jack Point and Fairfax, competing for Elsie's attentions. Fairfax, having escaped from the tower, is hiding in plain sight, disguised as Leonard Merrill. Phoebe starts to fall for him, so she becomes upset when she sees Fairfax flirting with Elsie. Point has convinced everyone, including Elsie, that Fairfax was killed trying to escape and that Elsie is now a widow and free to marry him. So Point, too, is upset to see the affection Leonard, Fairfax in disguise, shows Elsie. Phoebe can see Fairfax slipping away, and Point can see Elsie slipping away. 
A trio and quartet with two of our principals suffering from unrequited love ensues. The following scenes and songs are very apropos, as the other three performers in these scenes would become good friends, with whom I would do many more productions. The incomparable Renee Haynes, portraying Elsie Maynard, and I would go on to perform opposite each other in most of the Connecticut GNS Society productions since 2013. Dave Henderson captures the extreme breadth of emotions in his portrayal of the pivotal character Jack Point. Dave usually loses the girl to me in these topsy-turvy GNS plots, and Yeoman is no exception. The fourth member of the quartet, Phoebe Merrill, is performed by the very talented Julie Rumbold, with whom I have performed many times since. I count all three, and many others I met in that first year tripping the lights fantastic together, as friends, playmates, and my artistic community. Some of the best Sullivan scores are his trios, quartets, and quintets. The upcoming trio and quartet are among my favorites. From a performer's viewpoint, making beautiful music together to communicate to an audience is why we do theater. As you listen to the following words and music, you will see how Sullivan's close harmonies and Gilbert's madcap plots on stage can and do create close friendships off stage. Enjoy. Nay, sweetheart, be comforted. This fair is but a pestilent fellow, and as he had to die, he might as well die thus as any other way. Twas a good death. Still, he was my husband, but had he not been, he was nevertheless a living man. And now he is dead, and so by your leave, my tears may flow unshed in master point. <laughs> and thou didn't see all this? I, with both eyes at once, this and that. <laughs> the testimony of one eye is not, he may lie. But when it is corroborated by the other, it is good evidence that none may gainsay. Here are both present in court, ready to swear to him. But art thou sure to spare that? Saw you his face? Aye, and a plaguey ill favored face, too. A very hangdog face. A felon face. A face to fright the headman himself and make him strike a ride. Oh, a plaguey bad face. Take my word for it. <laughs> How they laugh. Tis ever thus a simple folk. And accepted wit as but to say, pass the mustard, and they roll their ribs up. <laughs> if ever I come to life again, thou shalt pay for this, Master Points. Now, Elsie, thou art free to choose again. So behold me. I am young and well favored. I have a pretty wit. I can just you, drive you, cook you, crank you, wrap you. Thou knowest not how to woo. Tis not to be done with time worn jests and threadbare sophistries, with quips, conundrums, rhymes, and paradoxes. It is an art in itself, and must be studied bravely and conscientiously. <laughs> A man who would woo a fair maid Should practice himself to the trade And so he'll take in a thoughtful way How to flatter, cajole, and persuade He should practice himself at fourteen And practice from morning to evening. And when he's of age, if he will or engage He may capture the heart of a queen the heart of a queen. It is purely a matter of skill, which all may attain if they will. But every time he must or even that if he wants to make sure he's still, if he wants to make sure of his still. Oh, me a tame, they will. 
That he does, right well. He is but a man of poor estate, but he hath a loving, honest heart. And if thou wilt be his wife, thou shalt lie curled up in his heart like a little squirrel in its nest. Tis a pretty figure. A maggot in a nut lies closer. <laughs> but a squirrel will do. He knows that thou wast a wife, an unloved and unloving wife, and his poor heart was near to breaking. But now that thine unloving husband is dead, and thou art free, he would fain pray that thou wouldst hearken unto him, and give him hope that thou wouldst one day be his. He presses a hand and whispers in her ear, Oh, Bob, you, what does this mean? And now, sweetheart, tell me, wilt thou be this poor good fellow's wife? He's a good, brave man. Is he a brave man? So men say. Uh, that's not true, but uh, let it pass. If the brave man will be content with a poor, penniless, untaught maid. Widow, but let that pass. Then I will be his true and loving wife. But that was my heart of hearts. My own dear love. Why, what's all this? Brother, brother, it is not saintly. Oh, I can't let that pass. Hold is not, Master Lynn. An advocate should have its fee, but methinks thou art overpaying thyself. Nay, that is for Elsie to say. I promise thee I would show thee how to woo. And herein lies the proof of the virtue of my teaching. Go thou and show it elsewhere. <laughs>
I'm John Friedman, Connecticut Gilbert and Sullivan Society Vice President and Producer. Each year, the Connecticut Gilbert and Sullivan Society stages a different show from the GNS Canon. In 2017, CGNSS staged Princess Ida, a show that I had hardly ever heard of and knew very little about. What I had heard was not very flattering. Some told me they thought that the storyline and characters were dull, and thought that audiences found the dialogue written in blank verse, overly long, tedious, and boring. But after listening to a production of Ida performed by Ohio Light Opera, I concluded differently. I thought the music was some of the best GNS I had heard, and I thought that the blank verse style, rather than making the dialogue boring, punctuated the humor and made the dialogue great fun to listen to, much like listening to the clever banter in a Shakespeare play. I also found the storyline engaging and thought that the characters and the way they played off of one another was very funny. And the character that I thought the most fun of all was Ida's father, King Gama, a repugnant and wizened little man with a snarky attitude. Perfect, I thought to myself, that's a part I'd love to play. So I was thrilled when I was given the opportunity to play Gama in the 2017 production. I set to work on learning the part. I found myself a gnarled and worm-eaten piece of driftwood that I thought reflective of Gama's repugnant form and twisted mind, to use as Gama's walking stick. I worked on facial expressions, postures, voice pacing, and intonations that I thought best embodied Gama's warped personality. Then it occurred to me, just be yourself. <laughs> In Act One of Princess Ida, we learned that Ida was betrothed by her father to Prince Hilarion 20 years ago when she and the prince were both babies. In the beginning of Act One, we find King Hildebrand, Prince Hilarion, his son, and the court of Castle Hildebrand, all awaiting Ida's arrival for her marriage to the prince. But neither she nor her father are anywhere to be found, and Hildebrand is vowed to go to war with Gama if he reneges on their arrangement. Just as they conclude that Gama is a no-show, he sneaks into court. There he breaks into a song, If You Give Me Your Attention in which he recounts to all in great detail his irritating traits and shocking behavior and wonders aloud why everyone finds him such a disagreeable man. After he introduces himself, he goes into what I think is one of the funniest and most clever dialogues in all the GNS shows. In it, Gama teases and insults Hildebrand, Hilarion, and Hildebrand's court and explains in the most facetious way why Ida is not with him on this most important day. 
Here then is that scene with Craig Martin as King Hildebrand, Tim Throckmorton as Prince Hilarion, Dave Henderson as Florian, Henry Cox as Cyril, and yours truly as King Gama. If you give me your attention, I will tell you what I am. I'm a genuine philanthropist, all other kinds are sham. Each little fault of temper and each social defect in my airy fellow creatures, I endeavor to correct. To all their little weaknesses, I open people's eyes. And little plans to snub the self-sufficient, I devise. I love my fellow creatures, I do all the good I can. Yet everybody says I'm such a disagreeable man, and I can't think why. <laughs> to compliments inflated, I have a withering reply. And vanity, I always do my best to mortify. A charitable action, I can skillfully dissect. And interested motives, I'm delighted to detect. I know everybody's income and what everybody earns. And I carefully compare it with the income tax return. But to benefit humanity, however much I plan, yet everybody says I'm such a disagreeable man, and I can't think why. I'm sure I'm no aesthetic, I'm as pleasant as can be. You always find me ready with a crushing repartee. I'm an irritating chuckle. I'm a celebrated sneer. I'm an entertaining snigger. I'm a fascinating leer. To everybody's prejudice, I know a thing or two. I can tell a woman's age in half a minute. And I do. You are not fooling anyone, my good woman. But although I try to make myself as pleasant as I can, yet everybody says I'm such a disagreeable man, and I can't think why. I can't think why. I can't think why. So. This is Castle Hildebrand. <laughs> well, well. Dame Rumor whispered that the place was grand. <laughs> she told me that your taste was uh, exquisite. <laughs> oh, superb. <laughs> Unparalleled. <laughs> oh, really, King? Uh, but she's a liar. <laughs> Look how old you've grown. No. Is this hilarious? Why, you've changed too. You were a singularly handsome child. <laughs> Are you a courtier? Come then, ply your trade, tell me some lies. How do you like your king? Vile rumor says he's all but imbecile. Now that's not true. Oh, my lord, we love our king. His wise remarks are valued by his court as precious stones. <laughs> and for the self-same cause, like precious stones, his sensible remarks derive their value from their scarcity. <laughs> uh, come now, be honest. Tell the truth for once. Tell it of me. Come, come. I'll harm you not. Uh, this leg is crooked. This foot is ill-designed. The shoulder wears a hump. Come, out with it. Look. Here is my face. <laughs> and now, am I not the worst of nature's blunders? Nature never airs. To those who know the workings of your mind, your uh, face and figure, sir, suggest a book. Appropriately bound. <laughs> Why, what, ye, sir, how dare you bandy words with me? No need to bandy oh. that which appertains. <laughs> Do you permit this, king? We are in doubt whether to treat you as 
honoured guest, or traitor knave who flights his word and breaks it. If the casting votes with me, I give it for the former. Hmm. <laughs> we shall see. By the terms of our agreement, signed and sealed, <laughs> you are bound to bring the princess here today. Why is she not with you? Answer me this. Uh, what think you of a wealthy, purse-proud man who, when he calls upon a starving friend, pulls out his gold and flourishes his notes and flashes diamonds in the pauper's eyes? Uh, what name have you for such an one? Uh, uh, <laughs> a trump. Ah, <laughs> just so. <laughs> the girl has beauty, virtue, wit, grace, humor, wisdom, charity, and... Uh, Oh, would it be kindly, I thank you to parade these brilliant qualities before your eyes? Oh, no. King Hildebrand, I am no trump. Stop that tongue, or you shall lose the monkey head that holds it. Oh, bravo, bravo. Your king deprives me of my head that he and I might meet on equal terms. Where is she now? In Castle Adamant. One of my many country houses. Uh, there she rules a woman's university with full hundred girls who learn of her. A hundred girls? A hundred ecstasy? But no mere girls, my good young gentleman. With all the college learning that you boast, the youngest there would prove a match for you. Oh, with all my heart, if she's the prettiest, it Fancy a hundred matches all alight. That's if I strike them as I hope to go. Despair your hope. Their hearts are dead to men. Oh. He who desires to gain their favor must be qualified to strike their teeming brains and not their hearts. Their safety matches serve and they like only on the knowledge box. Uh, so you no chance. <laughs> there are no males whatever in those walls? None, gentlemen. Accepting letter mails, and they are driven, as males often are, in other large communities by women. Why, bless my heart, she'll scarcely suffer Sir Arthur's hymns. And all the animals she owns are hers. Uh, the ladies rise at cock crow every morning. Aha! Then they have male poultry. <laughs> Not at all. The crowing's done by an accomplished hen. Oh. Hi, I'm Kathleen Thompson, and I'm here to talk about a scene from the 1999 HMS Pinafore. Now, it's not supposed to be me in front of the camera. I'm supposed to be behind the camera recording Bob Cumming talking. Unfortunately, as you may have already heard, Bob Cumming passed away before we were able to record this video. Now, Bob was the director of this 1999 Pinafore, but he wasn't just the director. He, along with Leighton Frainer and some others, were the founders of Connecticut Gilbert and Sullivan Society. Bob directed most of the shows for 35 years. He was the heart and soul behind the group, not only directing, but also producing and doing a lot of the publicity. Now this scene that Bob and I selected is a classic example of Bob's staging brought to life by Leighton Frainer. The story behind HMS Pinafore is on a ship, aptly called the HMS Pinafore. Sir Joseph Porter is visiting and he's the Admiral of the Navy. The captain is trying to get his daughter Josephine married to Sir Joseph. Unfortunately, Josephine is in love with a common seaman, Rafe Rextra. All sorts of hilarity ensues as they try to decide what to do about that. And you will see in this scene, which is just after Josephine sang a famous aria, The Hours Creep on Apace, that she's been trying to decide between the God of Love, which is her love for Rafe, and the God of Reason, which is should she marry Sir Joseph. This scene is the point where she's made her decision. Now, Bob and I didn't just pick this scene because it was his staging with Leighton performing. It's also because the music is so bright and the lyrics are witty. 
but there was some pretty interesting staging going on. Watch the circles before each of the verses and how we have to somehow manage to swap places each time. And then there's Leighton's comic timing and how he milks the humor out of every single gesture. Not only that, but the way Jerry and Leighton play off each other is hilarious in some sections. They did this in the Mikado too, as Leighton played Coco and Jerry played Poobah. Not only that, but I got to actually sing with my husband on stage in this show. Normally, because he was a baritone and I'm a soprano, we didn't get to sing together. But in this operetta, we got to sing together several times. And lastly, one of the other reasons why it's one of my favorite scenes is because I got to do this with Bob and Leighton as part of the Gilbert and Sullivan Trio. Now, Bob and Leighton formed the Gilbert and Sullivan Trio in New York and they started with a soprano there, and then they went through a long line of wonderful sopranos who sang in the Gilbert and Sullivan Trio with them. This number was one of the signature pieces from that performance. I got to be the last of the long line of sopranos, and every time we sang this number, we were doing a last minute review of those circle things in the hallway. So it turns out that this clip is a tribute to Bob in more ways than just his brilliant staging. It's also for the many times that he performed this scene as the captain. So here's to you, Bob, Leighton, and Jerry. May you rest in peace, and may there always be one more encore.
Hello, my name is Judy Kerrigan, and I'm a member of the board of the Connecticut Gilbert and Sullivan Society. So that wraps things up for now. We are beginning to make preparations for staging a live production of Rudigore this fall and hope that the health and safety protocols for dealing with COVID will enable us to do so. Regardless of whether or not we're able to bring you live entertainment this year, we are going to continue to bring you GNS video entertainment via our YouTube channel. In May, we will be premiering a video of our 2014 performance of The Gondoliers. Please be sure to join our members and friends in the online watch party. We will announce the date and time for this premiere on our Facebook page. If you have not already done so, we invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you will automatically receive notifications whenever we post new content. Whether live on stage or online, we hope to see you again soon.